You might be thinking to yourself, Milner, don't you dare ever wear that shirt again. Why would you wear a shirt like that during a book review? There is a method and a reason to my madness. At one point in my life, from 1997 to the year 2000, I worked for Kodak Professional. We used to joke that Kodak wasn't a job, it was a wardrobe. A lot of things about Kodak hadn't changed since the inception of the company, including their proclivity to give us field personnel the most horrific set of oversized, oddly colored golf shirts with Kodak logos on them. They were terrible. They came in yellow, they came in turquoise, they came in purple, chartreuse. They were all always extra XL, XL, double XL, triple XL. They were like circus tents. They would line us up at events and everybody had to wear the same shirt. It was terrible. At one point, my boss, God love him, he's no longer with us, great guy said, I gotta draw a line in the sand. I can't be seen in public in these shirts ever again. And he went on a quest to make a black one and a denim one. And it was huge. It went all the way up in the hierarchy and management. Can we put someone in the field in a black shirt and not a size triple XL yellow golf shirt that no one wants to wear? He won, we won, Kodak was better for it. That's why I'm wearing this shirt. This shirt has every color under the sun and it is a dedication to the company of Eastman Kodak. So, welcome back to the Books I Love series. I have been fortunate enough in my blurb career to be able to travel many times for the company. One of the places I get to travel is Australia. Australia to me has one of the most unique creative industries in the world. And there's also a tremendous amount of people who come in from other parts of the world to Australia during things like the Head On Photo Festival, which is the world's largest photo festival. You've also got events like uh, Analog Digital, you've got Semi Permanent amongst many, many others, the Sydney Book Fair, you've got, it's just, a f the summers in Australia are festival heaven. During one of these events, I met a photographer named Catherine Lutenegger, and Catherine did a book called Kodak City. And this is a book that I wanna talk about today, why I love this book, why the ingredients are so good, why it had a personal impact on me, which I already mentioned before. I worked for Kodak Professional for about four and a half years. It was an incredibly entertaining time. It was a challenging time. I learned a lot. I worked with fantastic people. I have a tr tremendous amount of respect for the company of Kodak and the lineage that they gave us as photographers. Kodak over the last 20, 25 years has taken an absolute beating. And in some cases it's a self-inflicted wound. There was a lot of bad decisions made. There was a lot of turnover. There was a lot of craziness that went down in the company, but none of us as photographers would be where we are today without Kodak. And I think that that's something that we have to tip our hats to, we have to give tribute to. Catherine was able to do this book, get fantastic access, She's a really good photographer and she was a delightful person to be around. I think that that often gets overlooked. I think people look at, at the work of a photographer and yes, that's important. But for me personally, when you meet these photographers in person and they're nice, professional, courteous, interesting, and they can produce a book like this, yeah, that's called good deal, people. So let's talk a little bit about this. And I'm gonna do the old top-down secret sauce here in a minute to go through some of the pages and some of the design aspects and things that I like. But there's a bunch of things that we have to talk about up front here, which is namely how this book came to be and who are the people that are responsible for it. So one of the things that Catherine did that I think is smart, intelligent, and also not easy to do because it's very hard to get certain people to write forwards for or introductions or essays for your book, but one of the things when you go to publish a photography book through a traditional publisher, one of the things that's often recommended, in some cases the publisher will insist upon it, is that certain people have to write forwards or introductions for the book. For example, my project in Italy, I was sort of forced by the publisher, which I ended up not doing, but the publisher said to me, oh, you're doing this project, we've seen the work, we love it, we think it should be a book, you have to get Gore Vidal to write the forward. And I was like, Gore Vidal's not gonna write my forward. Long story short, that never happened, but that was the point, which because Vidal is gonna bring his own audience, he's gonna add credibility and lend, lend sort of uh, intelligence, perspective, critique, whatever, to the, to the process. Catherine actually went above and beyond. 
because not only did she get A.D. Coleman to write for the book, she also got Jorg Bader to write for the book, and she got Urs Stahl to write for the book. I got through that pronunciation just barely. But it's beautiful. In the beginning of this book, and again, I'll show you in the top down, those are three people that have very much have insight into photographic history, criticism, context. It's very important when you read through this. Plus, when you're talking about a subject matter like Eastman Kodak, the residue of that company is in every single thing we do. And Kodak doesn't get credit for a lot of things they do, like developing the digital sensor and things like that. People sort of gets overlooked in the process of people saying, wow, that company sure went down the, down the, the tank. Uh, let's also talk about the who put this book together. Like, how the heck did it, where did it come from? Who's involved? In the back of this book, and I'll, I guess I'll save this for the top down, there's a couple, couple of the bios, but let's just talk about the actual publishing team. You're sick of hearing me say this, but a book like this is not Catherine Lutenegger in her basement putting this together. It's Catherine Lutenegger and a team of other people who are helping put this, put this project into the works. And she goes and thanks a ton of people at the back of this book, and I, I will get to it because it's important. This is the first edition, a thousand copies printed in Germany. That's important. Germany is a really good photo book publishing country. And a thousand copies gives you context as to how photo books are produced now. I think a lot of times, and this is a classic thing for me, when I give lectures at art schools, I always ask students, okay, if you're a first book author, how many copies of your photo book do you think that publishers will print on the first run? And the number one answer I get is 100,000. Yes, students are delusional. I was there myself at one point. So a thousand copies of a book run is, is normal to me. I actually like that number of copies because it's a manageable number. It allows Catherine to really hit the road hard, try to get those books placed, sold, and then move on with her life and be able to go do another project instead of printing several thousand, which can then draw out sometimes one year, two year, three years down the road. People are still trying to get rid of their books. It's very hard. Okay, artistic advisor was Kristen Dietrich. The texts are from A.D. Coleman, Jorg Bader, Urs Stahl, and Catherine Lutenegger herself. The translations uh, was done by Energy Translation for A.D. Coleman, Judith Hayward for Jorg Bader and, and Stahl, Jean-Pierre Luer, uh, blah, blah, Elizabeth Lyman uh, also for Catherine Lutenegger. The proofreading was done by Jean-Pierre Lewerer, Jean-Marc Meunier, Suzanne Perret, Ariane Poyer. Uh, my, my accent and my pronunciation, if it could possibly get any worse, I don't know how it could get that way. Concept, Chris Gouch and Catherine Lutenegger. Design, Chris Gouch. Again, I'm, I'm mispronouncing literally every single one of these names. Typefaces, Swiss International, Swiss New by Swiss Typefaces. Image Processing, Samuel Rouge. The paper is Profit Bulk, 150 gram. Cover Illustration, Traffic Lights, West, Road, West Ridge Road, 2012. This is published with generous support of Pro Helvetic, Vel, Helvetia, the Swiss Arts Council, Canton Devout, Ville de Lausanne, Swiss Society of New York, Perrin phrase is some, another thing that I can't pronounce, and Broncolor. And this is a, uh, a Kerr out of Berlin. So Kerr Publishing, Kerr Verlag is the publisher out of Berlin. And they do a lot of really good photo books. So maybe I'll just, maybe I'll get updated to 2021 and I'll actually include this stuff in the description of this film. But let's take a top down look at why I think this book is beautiful and you can decide for yourself. All right, my friends, let's have a look at Kodak City by Catherine Lutnegger. A couple of things right off the bat. Really nice band, gray linen cover, foil stamp. Uh, Catherine Lutnegger, Kodak City. This is beautifully done. You will also notice a placeholder ribbon here in the bottom that runs in the book, depending if you want to keep your place by using the ribbon. These are a couple of things I absolutely love. I think photo books with a linen cover and foil stamping, I think that is the, the, ex, the total extent of customizations. I don't think you need to ever go, I shouldn't say ever. I don't think, I think it's a rare occasion when you need to customize the cover even more than that. This to me is the sweet spot of what a beautiful photo book looks like. Now, also nice touch, postcard included. I have not filled it out yet. I'm still waiting to figure out who to send it to. Do I know anyone left at Kodak? I don't know. All right, let's dive in. Catherine signed this book to me in Sydney, which is uh, fantastic. I don't, not all my books are signed. 
it's just fun when you meet the author and you're able to actually spend a little time with them and they, uh, they sign the book. It's kind of nice. Okay, start a nice little double truck, Rochester. Okay, again, I'm only gonna show a very limited amount of this book. I never know how an author's gonna feel about me doing sort of a book. Uh, I wouldn't even call this a review. These are books that have had emotional resonance with me. They've had impact on me and that's the only reason I'm showing them to you. I've got a lot of photo books. Not all of them made an impact, this one did. We start the book with the essays. In, the, uh, in this case, A.D. Coleman. And A.D.'s got a nice little run here of what he's bringing to the table. Then you've got Jorg Bader. You've got Urs Stahl. And you have Catherine uh, herself when I get to her here in a minute. Here we go. So a lot of copy up front. This is two books in a row with a lot of copy up front. And this one was published in 2014-ish area. And the last one I showed you was published in 1988. And uh, two books, ironically, that have a lot of copy up front. The first piece of art in the book, really, is this frame. And the crazy thing about this frame is if anyone who's ever been to Rochester, this sets a mood for that town that's about as good as it gets, right? This gray cloud cover, the river, the old bridges, the brick buildings, this looks, feels, and smells like the city of Rochester. That's why it's so important. She's setting the table here for what's to come. Now I'm gonna jump forward here. This is a place I used to love in the city. When I would go there for Kodak, sometimes in the middle of winter, sometimes in summer, it was always a nightmare for me to get to Rochester from the West Coast. In four and a half years of working for Kodak, I never made it on time. I never actually had my flights get to the city at the time they were supposed to. The, the record for me was eight hours delayed getting to Rochester. Many times I had to spend overnight in cities that I was never even intending to get to because the weather in this part of the country is really spotty. So this place to me was incredibly distinctive. There's a lot of memories for me here and it's very much representative of, this, of the look and feel of this city. Okay, moving on. One thing about this is really cool is Catherine got really good access. She got access to a lot of the buildings and facilities that were Kodak buildings and facilities. And I have to say, still to this day, they are some of the most distinctive buildings I've ever been in. But that use, the use of the word distinctive here is what I should say distinctively Kodak. And that is what I would say by the time I had arrived at Kodak, I would call that awkward. I would call that dated. I would call that innocent. There was kind of a dorkiness to Kodak. And I mentioned the golf shirts. That was just part of it. But an ad like this, Rochester Truly Colorful, with this, this is so Kodak, I don't, I can't even stand myself with the little Kodak emblem down here and kind of the sparseness. I love this. This looks, feels, and breathes Kodak, and I think uh, it's a really nice, nice pick. I also put this in here. Um, I'm not sure who this person is. Obviously a Kodak employee. She's got her badge around her, around her neck. When you would drive through Rochester, like, is, like any other, any city, you see office workers who are outside smoking and she's actually smoking. But this brought back memories for me because I had a Kodak badge as well. And I had uh, transitional uh, glasses at the time, meaning that when I was outside, they would transition to being sunglasses. And then when I went inside, if you gave it enough time, they would go back to being regular, clear, non-tinted lenses, right? These are very common these days. So I actually got my badge made while my glasses were still in the sunglass mode. And the guy who was making the pictures at the, for the badges, who took his job very seriously, realized it after my badge had been made. And he said, oh my God, oh no, oh no, I'm gonna get in trouble. Um, you're the only person in the history of the company who's got their badge with sunglasses. Once I heard that, I was like, I gotta keep this badge. Like, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. I'm one in a hundred thousand right now. So anyway, that's what made me laugh about this, but I think this is nice, adds a human element as well. Okay, we're gonna skip some big chunks here. The inside of this book, gorgeous. There's a million pictures in here that I really like that, again, this is not, this is not an artist-driven book. This is a story-driven book. This is not Catherine saying, Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at my photography, look at my photography. This is Catherine saying, look at the content that's in these photographs. Look at the story. Look at the city, the people, the company, the buildings, the infrastructure that once was this grand thing has now been reduced to what you're seeing in these photographs. This to me, amazing. This is about access. This is about getting into these Kodak 
buildings. And Kodak was famous for like leaving stuff on the wall that was so old. Prints would have, would fade and they would leave them on the wall. There were offices here that had three inch orange shag carpet on the floors. Very strange. This brings back memories. I love the fact it's void of people. You would walk into these buildings and certain buildings literally felt deserted, even though there'd be a handful of people in the entire building still working. So I think this is really effective. Okay. I'm going to skip last picture. I'm going to show you, which is kind of sad, but it's actually, when you see this up close, it's, kind of, it's rather pixelated, but it doesn't matter because these are buildings being imploded, um, former Kodak buildings that are being imploded. This kills me every time I see this because some of the most historic buildings have been crushed and you cannot imagine the photo history that was created in that building that is no longer. So I was there once for a building being imploded and it was kind of heartbreaking. So I liked, the, I liked how she ends, ends on that. Uh, there's, a, there's an index and then there's plenty of acknowledgements here in the back. And this is really smart. I mean, she's acknowledging the, the sponsorship, the publisher, the people who wrote the essays, the backers of the project. I think this gives you a description in a nutshell as to the complexity of putting a book like this into the world. Just wrangling the people who are doing the essays wrangling and thanking and taking care of the backers, the publisher, all of that stuff, it's really important. That's a beautiful book. I think that is as good a sample as you're gonna get of a successful story-driven photography book, and I hope you enjoyed it. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that uh, Books I Love series. Let's say congratulations to Catherine. I will put her links uh, in the description below so that you can follow up with what she's up to now. I honestly have no idea what she's up to now, but my guess is something probably pretty good. I think if you look at American history and American industry and society, culture, cities, I think you would be hard pressed to find a more distinctive relationship than you would between Eastman Kodak and Rochester, New York. I think Kodak as a company infiltrated American society for sure, but global culture as well at a level and in a way that is completely unique to the world. And to see sort of where they are now and the, and the steps back that have happened in the city, a place like Rochester, which is a city I actually really like. I enjoyed my time going there. It was completely unlike where I grew up. So it was like traveling to another country. It heart, it's, it's heartbreaking for me to see some of the things that have happened to Kodak over the years. And I think this book does a really good service of documenting something that will never return that was very much a part of the fabric of american culture and so i hope you enjoyed that and i will be back with more book reviews